This is Edge. I have my co-host here, the speaker. How you doing, speaker? I'm good. What's happening? I'm doing all right. It's a crazy world out there. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about something that um, is pertinent to what's going on in the world today. Uh, we're going to talk about the differences of collectivism versus individualism. All right. We're going to try every week to stay on a topic that is relevant, um, but every now and then we're probably going to go off the deep end. So I'm just chucking the warning out there right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about collectivism versus individualism. First of all, what? how do you define collectivism versus your definition of individualism? Well, individualism to me, is someone that is uh, independent, self-reliant, and is, is an individual from the collective or state control. That 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 is just that, that that's my basic definition of individualism. Uh, individualism, uh, collectivism is can can be complicated because there's subcategories of collectivism. Um, the, like straight out of the dictionary, meaning of collectivism is an emphasis on the collective rather than individual action or identity, right? But I think, I, I, I think collectivism is a malignant cancer on society. Um, and I will get into that. But um, I, I think Anne Ryan said it best, and I'm not really a fan of hers, but I think she got it right when it came to collectivism. And uh, like a quote straight from her, um, collectivism means the subjugation of an individual to a group whether to a race, class, or state, does not matter. Collectivism holds that man must be chained to collective action and collective thought for the sake of what is called the common good. That is a good definition. I like that. I am a, a fan of Ayn Rand. You're not? Eh, not really. I need to read more of her stuff. But Yeah. Mm. All right. So the way I see it is collectivism is this shift of focus from on government and on society, but it's based on this philosophy that we as individuals were just sheep and we're too stupid to be held responsible for our own decisions and that we're not really individuals capable of making our own decisions, rather that we're this product of society that's molded us. And it's the responsibility of, say, experts and rulers, the ruling class, to make those decisions for us. Because if we were able to make those decisions, we might, might make the wrong decision for ourselves. And so, you know, this, this idea of collectivism, it, it ends up usually with, you know, more government control and the decrease of individual rights. So, but on the flip side, I see individual philosophy um, as, you know, which is an, Ameri an, an American value that we've held from our foundation. It's one that, it's the role of government to provide just a setting in which individuals can thrive and pursue their own development in accordance with their own values. And that the individual will be held accountable for you know, their own failures, um, but also at the same time reap the rewards of their own successes. So um, individualism, you know, it places a value and a faith in each individual human life, whereas the collective philosophy, it devalues individual lives and freedoms for the sake of the whole. That's how I see it. It's mm -hmm. a good definition. And I think we're seeing mass toxic collectivism playing out at the moment on the culture war. I mean, look at political correctness, which is just late stage Marxism, you know, a collectivist ideology. Right. And I was going to talk about that, about how um, with collectivism um, it, it there has to be a certain amount of control I see this this redefinition of words by collectivists today you know they they redefine the word freedom for example with us freedom is like a free you know free speech freedom of religion freedom to peaceably 
a symbol, um, you know, free exchange of not just products, but of ideas. But that is not their definition of freedom. Their definition of freedom is more of the ability to have, you know, free health care, you know, Obamacare, free education, you know, Bernie, Bernie promising, you know, to eliminate student debt, freedom to, you know, end the lives of the unborn. Uh, they want to stifle the individual freedoms which is the free market of ideas and freedom of speech, most definitely. And the only way that their uh, collectivist philosophy thrives is if the free market of ideas um, is stifled, because um, I do think the individualist philosophy is one that resonates with the American people and most people, free thinking people in the world, you know, and the only way to um, force people into that, um, that, that philosophy of collectivism is to censor and suppress um, the, the opposing side, wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think, uh, like, be, like I said, there's subcategories of collectivism. What we're seeing is like toxic, malignant collectivism playing out. I mean, the, the West is generally um, an individualistic society, um, free capitalism, free thinking. I, Asia is more a collectivist um, ideology, but like I said, there's subcategories. So in so Japan is a collectivist ideology, um, but they but their collectivism works on more of like hierarchy of family, shared property, group ownership, um, and uh, looking after the elderly and putting the elderly among everyone else. Uh, you know, like look at them for wisdom and stuff like that. That's a form of collectivism, which I think is healthy. Right. Well, when you compare, say, Japan to China, for example, you There's know, big, because yeah, huge, difference, huge, yeah. huge difference there. And I think that, um, you know, when you, you're, you, there is a difference as far as um, the concept of individualism versus um, collectivism between those two societies. Um, I know that, that China has... Um, mm, tried to allow some form of capitalism not really it's a lot of state control but in japan it, it's really I think, it's not capitalism it's corporatism it's corporatism that's a good way of of, of uh, defining that so which do you think is better i think we we're gonna agree here but tell me <laughs> what <laughs> which do you think is better individualism uh, versus collectivism always individualism um but like i i, I think there's toxic individualism um, you you can go really bad on the individual scale when you become completely narcissistic and self-involved. Um, but I, I think as a whole, individualism is extremely, extremely important, especially in this day and age of where we're doing now, because there Definitely. is an attack, there is an attack on the individual by the group, by the group collective. And like I I don't think there's I, I don't want to get collectivism mixed up with groups because we're all parts of part of groups. I mean, you, Corey, and I are a group, um, which is not inherently bad. But I think when it starts to become bad is when the group becomes your primary personality instead of the individual becoming primary. Good point. Good point. That's a good way of, of describing it. I think individualism is better because, you know, if you value yourself as an individual – and you have the freedom to reap the benefits of your successes while also being held accountable for your failures, then you actually end up making a better contribution to society as a whole. So the society benefits from individuals thriving rather than on the flip side, if you believe that you know all possessions belong to everyone, and if you do something bad or illegal, that's not your fault, you're just you're just a product of society, then that makes it really easy to justify, you know, taking things from people, stealing, looting, destruction, chaos by individuals. That can all be justified by people who share this philosophy that possessions don't belong to anybody in particular. They're part of the collective. And crimes by people in the name of social justice are not their fault of the individuals. It's the fault of society who shaped them. You know, in essence, it's actually individualism that creates a better society as a whole, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I believe. I, I believe so, personally. I mean, look at most 
inventions of the 21st century and even beyond. Most of them have come from individual endeavors or individual thoughts. I mean, just take the planes, uh, plane or flight, for example, right? It was predominantly made up by the Wright brothers. It's two people. Right, it's not. It's not a group that was sitting around. It, you know, it came from the brainchild of one person. Right, free market of ideas is always going to allow the best ideas to thrive. You know, the only, it's only during this artificial suppression of the free market of ideas where bad ideas become the uh, the the consensus, the norm. and that's what we're seeing. You know, you have to suppress the free market of ideas in order for these. You know collectivist well, ideas to thrive well we're, we're yeah we're, we're, we're seeing that artificially managed now which is a complete stain on human evolution i believe because it doesn't allow good ideas to come to the top um right. l l like you said they push groupthink they push group ideology they're pushing collectivism it it, it it's like let's take black lives matters for example Right, I don't support Black Lives Matters. I, I think it's a Marxist ideology, right? But that, in a whole, doesn't mean I don't respect, you know, races, or does, it doesn't mean that I'm racist. I'm completely against racism, right? But in this political climate, if you do not support Black Lives Matters, it means you're a racist, which is collective right. thought. Right, it's this bullyism against pitting one group against the other, where if you don't um, share the same ideology, then you're publicly shamed, uh, you're, you know, defamed and, and demoralized um, simply for having a, a different opinion or a different thought about things. Um, so, yeah, the, the group think... Um, has really put us in a really sad state of affairs today, hasn't it? Hmm, of course. I mean, we've we've seen it throughout history. I mean, oh, there's, yeah. there's times in history where collectivism has Soviet Union, Nazism was a form of collectivism. Right. It doesn't have to be. It's, you know, on the right and the left, these yeah, of forms course. of collectivism. Yes. So of all the times in history, you know, we could look back at some examples of collectivism over individualism and how that arose. I see some some hallmarks, some key factors that if you looked back in history, you know, what were those elements that allowed that to thrive, you know, and you applied that to today, you could learn something and say, you know, look, oop, there's a red flag that's happening now. You know, it's like we weren't taught a lot of the real history of things. You know, like how did these people rise to power in the past? They had to convince a lot of people. And how did that come about? Well, you know, so I see, you know, back in, in if you look at collectivism and history, um, you know it always kind of arose out of out of chaos, out of crisis. It's like they take advantage of an opportunity, whether it's a manufactured crisis or an actual one. But that's how they spark a revolution, um, and, and they usually do it by you know making big promises. Like for example, with Lenin, you know the. These people were, it was a war-torn war -torn society, the people were impoverished, you know, and Lenin was promising, you know, food, land, and peace, like we talked about last and, week. And, and equal distribution of wealth. Right. That's another hallmark of it, is equal distribution of wealth. And, you know, and we talked about this last week, you know, to these people, it, it seems all good. You know, they, they can justify it in their minds, like, yes, this, you know, who wouldn't want food, land, and peace? You know, who, who wouldn't think it would be fair for everybody to all have the same thing? But the application of it is never the way that it's promised. And also, another kind of hallmark of these, these times in history where collectivism arose is they always had leaders that were very charismatic, right? Oh, like, yeah, for, like, for example, you know, Castro, he convinced a lot of people, um, you know, he came from Marxist-Leninist um, ideology, and he appealed to, like, the, the poorest of the people. And, you know, he had the same sort of promises of, you know, taking from the rich and giving to the poor, this, you know, Robin Hood sort of fantasy. Hmm. Well, I, and on the other side, you have Hitler which promised total control and domination for the ultimate race. 
Right. That's another thing, like going back to um, using no good crisis goes to waste. Using fear, uh, that's a tactic that they always type, tend to use. They use a crisis, uh, they use chaos, and they use fear to spark a revolution um, towards that collectivist ideology. And, right. Uh, I mean, we yeah. see that today. We see that today. You could see it with, you know, COVID-19, you know, using that fear to 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 get people to, to go a certain way. You, you see it with, you know, the race war that we're, we're seeing ha playing out right now, uh -huh. um, you know, using this fear to spark um, a, a movement. Yep. And George Floyd was you know, a big one for it. Has, has pushed heaps of people, and, and, and unbeknownst to a lot of them, that they're supporting this early stage Marxist doctrine. They don't get it. They don't, they, they don't. They think it's something to fight inequality or to fight justice or to fight oppression, uh, like oppression. And on the surface level, those things are all fine. I don't mind if you want to fight those in a way. Do you know what I mean? But. Behind the scenes, there's something bigger playing out. And I think you have to be an individual and a person of individual thought to actually break that down and assess it. Right. So another uh, hallmark, I would say, of these collectivist sort of societies is they always have ground troops. You know, like these paramilitary groups of thugs that carry out the dirty work of the revolution. You know, we saw this back with, you know, back in the 30s, the German Communist Party, they had the anti-fascist, and I can't even pronounce it, anti-fascist action. There we go. <laughs> say it again. Say it again. Anti-fascist action. Did I say that right? I don't know. <laughs> All right. We're just roll with it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so, you know, back then, that was back in the 30s, but they carried out the same street fighting tactics that we see with Antifa today. Yeah, well, branches, you know? same thing. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And it's because you can't allow um, opposing thought, um, opposing ideas. Um, it has to be if you do, the, the, the free market of ideas, the best idea is going to rise to the top and people are not going to go with that that uh, collectivist uh, revolutionary sort of ideology. Um, so you have to suppress it. And how do you suppress it? Well, you have to use force. It's what we're, it's what we're saying now, play, play out in front of you. Force by way of shaming. Shaming is a really big playing. Um, and... In, in these times, you do need strong individuals to stand up because they're the ones that are going to make the difference. But at the moment, all these pussies are taking a knee. All these pussies don't understand what is actually going on. And they're just kowtowing to this movement, which is exactly what they want. Right, exactly. Another really good time in history that you could look back on where it was like an experiment between collectivism versus individualism. Hey, I'm going to give you a little history lesson because I don't know how much you know about, you know, American, his American history. Ooh, I, oh, but, I, I could tell you about Australian history. I'll tell you after this. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, the colony at Plymouth Rock, they were a perfect experiment of this. So the original... Plymouth Colony's charter was a system of communal property and communal labor. But what they found out, and William Bradford wrote about this, that that system resulted in the people, you know, that were actually once hardworking, they, they became lazy and unproductive. And their resources were squandered, you know, the re it resulted in mass starvation. They almost com all completely died off. And it was only like... Uh, when they were on the brink of collapse that they as a colony decided to shift their philosophy from collectivism to individualism and they began to not just survive but thrive when each of the individuals on at, in the colony was held responsible for their own food production imagine that yeah. <laughs> so in that example it was the focus on individualism that was cre that created the better society as a whole Little history lesson for you there. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not, not much to go on in my history. I was just going to say I'm I'm pretty much a convict. So, <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> so let's let's.
let's bring it and fast forward to today because there's a lot to talk about in this battle, this war that we're having right now currently between these two ideologies of collectivism versus individualism. And we can see it playing out in various different things. Um, so what are some examples of, you know, the collectivist ideology that we've seen? Uh, you, well, you, you, you see it now in just uh, groupthink when it, when it comes to groups. So like feminism... Is, is, is a big one that's collective ideology that is pushed on people. Right. Um, so, like, me as a female, I'm – the primary is that I'm I'm a female. I'm part of that collective. I'm not just me as an individual. So – and that is – that takes – precedence over it yeah. and and it and it dictates my decisions and it dictates you know what i what i do and think right and especially what you think of other people um okay yeah so you you see it play out heaps um now when it comes to the thought of other people which has becomes really infectious and destructive um so like the feminist way would be all men are horrible do you know what I mean it, 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 it's patriarchy um on right. other... I think with the collectivism you have to def you have to demonize one group in order to justify what your group is you know it, uh -huh. is fighting uh -huh. for is that a hundred percent and it becomes really dangerous when you can imply group guilt onto a, a, a group especially a race, is what we're seeing now with a lot of white people in this movement, cultural war. Like, you know, all white people are inherently evil, right? And people that are part of the collective, white people that are part of the collective, are kowtowing to this. They're bowing down to it. They are accepting this myth of white privilege. Um, and they're teaching their kids this. It's extremely, it's extremely toxic, right? And then on the other hand, you have us, which are in individual thought, who are like, well, you know, some white people were, you know, horrible people. Some black people are horrible people. Some Asian people are horrible people. There's horrible people in the world, right? Right, but yeah. Yeah, but I'm not going to condemn a whole race because of it. Exactly, right. right. Yeah, and I, I agree. The, and on the other foot, they do condemn. They condemn identities. They condemn people. They condemn races. They can them groups that are not their group. What's funny, though, is that when the group, the collective that is their protected group, so, for example, with Black Lives Matter, when they're faced with the inconsistencies of it, meaning, like, the black lives of police officers, because they're like, oh, shoot, you know, uh... Yeah. Do those matter? No. Okay, th that doesn't fit. Um, or when they're faced with st statistics as far as Planned Parenthood and uh, their history of eugenics and targeting black babies and how, you know, that is you know, disproportionately affecting the black community. W when they're faced with those facts, it's like a cognitive dissonance because it's like, ooh, you know, Black Lives Matter, but wait, that these Black Lives don't fit into our definition. It's only really the Black Lives Matter of the people who fit in their ideology, mm. correct? Well, that's what, that's why you have to skew the view. That's why they have to try to cancel and censor because they don't want this opposing viewpoint. Because it breaks the reality. Right. Yep. And then I see this manipulation of the words. Um, like we talked about just a little bit ago with the, the manipulation of the word freedom. And the manipulation of the word fairness. You know, fairness um, to the collectivist, it means equal distribution of stuff. You know, whereas fairness to us, the individualists, it means equal opportunities, equal rights to achieve your personal success, which you are responsible for achieving. Not, not equal outcome. Not equal outcome, equal opportunity. Yep. Right, right. Going back to using fear tactics and um, taking advantages of manipulated crises or 
um, actual crises, but taking advantage of those opportunities to spark a movement. Like, let's take ex the uh, the climate change crisis, for example, you know, and how that kind of is used that fear tactic of tactic of the world's going to end if we don't as a collective sacrifice our individual rights for the collective to save the world mm -hmm. right it sounds right to people with that you know they, they they can justify that in their minds but in reality it really is you know uh, convincing people to give up individual rights for the sake of the whole mm -hmm. um and it's using fear tactics to do that yeah I, I i saw a video recently with uh dr jordan peterson on this relative talk uh, topic when he was asked a question by a climate change activist that uh i, I think the question was was sort of um what should a young person do when they want to go out and change the world or change this uh sort of outcome that we're heading towards she was like fully extreme on her beliefs um uh because uh all, all you talk about is the individual etc etc and his answer to that was perfect in, in in my my opinion um and it was well if you can't clean up your own room or get your own life together you have no right to try to organize the world <laughs> Ah, oh, good point. Good well, point. It, it's, it's he's completely correct. You don't. If you don't have your own shit together, what makes you think you can make lasting change on the planet? And and, sure. would, it, and would it would and would it even be a proper change? Right. Right. What I've always seen is in the theory of collectivism, the idea sounds wonderful to these people, but the application of it always ends up horribly. Um, it ends up with a lot of corruption, a lot of mismanagement, a lot of um, wasted resources. Because what you're doing is you're trusting these people that are supposedly experts or that you've you know, deemed as the rulers or the the political elite to make the decisions for the collective, and it yields corruption and uh, just basically centralizes the power to those people at the top instead of decentralizing it and giving us all individual rights and freedom and responsibility to work towards a collective goal. I'm okay with working towards a collective goal. I'm okay with conservation uh, on a personal yeah, level. Of um, it, that's not what it's about. It's it's giving up individual rights and freedom under the fear that if you don't, we as a collective are going to all suddenly die. The world's going to end, and that's a lie. Uh, let's let let's not sugarcoat it though. These types of thoughts and these collectivist ideologies hasn't just led to those simple things. It's actually led to the deaths of millions of people. Absolutely, it has. Give some examples. Well, look at Leninism. Right, exactly. Mil millions of his own people were killed. Promises of, you know, food, a land, and peace, and, you know, ended up um, in total mismanagement and, you know, uh, a famine, really, mm -hmm. back then. So, um, in application, well, it just doesn't, hasn't worked in history. Why would we think it would work now? Hmm. Well, look at South Africa at the moment for a good example. Uh, the Boer people built the majority of infrastructure in South Africa, right? Um, so these are white South Africans. Um, that now that they've got this collective ideology that, that the, the South Africans are trying to take their country back and it's become a, a radical black power movement uh, to the point where they're murdering white farmers, um, their crops are drying up, they're running out of water. Mm. There you go. Uh, they're destroying their own country because of their hate towards an efficient group. Right. An group. Right. And I see that, you know, a microcosm of that same ideology, for example, with these riots that have been taking place in the name of George Floyd, in the name of Black Lives Matter. You know, uh, people looting and burning down the businesses in their own towns, many of whom were owned and operated by black people. 
who they don't you know they they'd been shut down for a couple of months already because of this whole pandemic and you know we're struggling themselves and so you know this concept of you know redistribution and um, you know taking from the rich and giving to the poor that's the concept the the actuality is the total destruction of um, the people that you're actually trying to protect in your collectivist ideology no mm -hmm. it. Uh, so what do we do what do we do well, we do what we always do, and we stand up as individuals, and we do not kneel to the mob. Uh, we do not kneel to pressure or the shame. Most of Hollywood will do it. Most of people in big paying jobs will do it. I mean, you've already seen it now in sports. Um, of course, they'll take the knee. I mean, the group mob is telling them to, and there's not a spine between any of them. Right. Terrible to say. All right, so we just continue to do what we're doing. We fight the, the good fight. We speak up. We, can, despite the censorship, we get out the vote. Um, we show up to rallies because they can't, they can't cover up those rallies. They can, they can fix the polls, but mm. they can't, they can't fix the rallies. That's a, that's another thing actually about collectivism. They are really good at organizing in groups where I find the individuals find it harder. And I, I, I think we see that play out on the right. It's really easy for liberals to get organized and it, it, it's all, all, almost like magic because they work as, not throwing our name under the bus, but the, because they work as a hive mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 they do. And on the right, it's more like, uh, you know, i got to do this today, I've got work to do, I need to do this, I need to go out and work for my family or whatever, and you're like, I, I, I need to sort this shit out. It's an individual mentality. So, you know, I'm not going to go and rock down the street. So I, I think that makes it actually a positive for them in that sort of a sense, and that right. can be negative for us. Well, they also have a lot of financial backing, and like you said, you know, f backing from a lot of politicians, you know, Joe oh. Biden's of the world, and Hillary Clinton's of the world, and AOC's, and Elon Omar's of the world. Um, they also have, like you said, the Hollywood backing them, mainstream media, glorif media glorifying them. Um, so they have... their their structure and their organization um, has a lot to do with the the people behind them supporting them. Oh, of, no? course. of course, it's 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 just it's through fear and it's through manipulation. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of these people that think kneeling down for the national anthem is a good thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, we're fighting against racism, whatever. But the truth behind it is they're just slowly getting you to disrespect your flag. That's a, that's what it is. They get, they're slowly getting you to disrespect the the foundations of your culture. Yes, and and it it everything ends up in the ultimate goal. They want open borders. They want no national pride. They want people to um to fully and willingly be ready to accept a one world government. And the only way that you're going to do that is by eroding pride in your nation, um, making you hate your own government, um, making you glorify this concept of collectivism, which has failed miserably in the past, but this time it's going to work. And the only way you're going to do that is by erasing history and not teaching children history, tearing down um, statues. Uh, um, you know, it's digital book book burning basically um, make people not remember the failures of, of this collectivism ideology in the past uh, so that they're doomed to repeat it the collective is God of the collective is always right and that mm, is what you yeah. right well you know what I believe the individual is the priority. I believe in individualism. I believe that we have rights that are not given to us by the collective or the government. Our rights are given to us straight from God. And I think that is well worth fighting for. And I think the way that we do it is we just continue the good fight, speaking out against it, showing up, um, 
and rallies, showing our presence, um, showing our up to vote. These are how we're. This is how we're going to battle it. And we really need some balls in high places. By balls in high places, I mean someone really going against the line at the moment and saying no. We do. We do. We have. We have a few brave ones out there. We need more for sure. Definitely. All right. You ready to wrap up? Let's wrap it. All right. Thanks for listening to us here on Hive Mind. You were listening to the speaker and myself, The Sharp Edge. Please share, like, subscribe, and hit that bell. We'll see you back next time right here on Hive Mind. Stay rabid. Bye. Bye.